This is Nightly Business Report with Tyler Matheson and Susie Guerin. Brought to you in part by TheStreet.com, featuring Herb Greenberg, who reminds investors that risk is real. With Herb Greenberg's Reality Check, researching stocks in terms of risk. You can learn more at TheStreet.com slash Reality Check. Market driver, companies are gobbling up tens of billions of dollars of their own shares. Are the buybacks making the market look healthier than it really is? High ceiling, why the sweet spot in the housing market could be going through the roof. And standard care, the nation's number two insurer says it will pay cancer doctors an incentive fee if they follow its treatment protocols. Smart business, smart medicine, neither or both. All this and more on Nightly Business Report for this, May 28th, 2014. Good evening, everyone. McDonald's served up a big happy meal for shareholders today. It announced a $20 billion package of stock buybacks and dividends by the year 2016. Now, this new plan could give investors 20% more cash than they received during the last three years. The higher return comes at a time of weak company growth at the fast food company as U.S. sales have continued to be disappointing. But despite the news, shares of McDonald's still slipped 1%. McDonald's and much of corporate America have a big appetite for buybacks, and so far this year, the stock repurchases are at lofty levels. Some Wall Street pros think buybacks have propped up the market. Is that true? And what does that mean for investors? Dominic Chu reports. According to S&P Dow Jones Indices analyst Howard Silverblatt, corporate stock buybacks are on pace to have their second biggest quarter ever with S&P 500 companies already reporting $157 billion in repurchases during the first quarter of 2014, and the numbers are still trickling in. Among the companies buying back the most of their own stock, oil and gas giant ExxonMobil, which bought back $4 billion worth in the first quarter, and computer services company IBM bought back $8 billion. Then there's Apple. It set a new record for the most stock ever repurchased by a company in a single quarter, by spending nearly $18 billion on its own shares. Many investors look towards buybacks as a bullish signal. When companies announce buybacks, a lot of people say that's an important thing to consider. It's not a perfect indicator, but it's a good indicator that management believes that their stock values are so attractive that it's better than anything else they can do with that portion of their cash, which includes investing in plant and equipment and also buying other companies. Some experts take a more cynical view. They say that buying back stock simply reduces the amount of a company's stock outstanding in the market, and that lets them show growth in earnings per share. But not everyone thinks that the stock buybacks are the only thing driving the market. I think that overall, uh, share buybacks have played a role. They've helped. But I think the main thing that's driving the market is the fundamentals. We're in a modest growth, modest inflation environment. Our American companies have figured out how to make money in that environment. Of course, a stock market at record highs is likely propelled by a variety of factors. Share repurchases of this size are a definite help. Now, the question is, will it be enough to keep the bull run going? For Nightly Business Report, I'm Dominic Chu. Well, not many bulls on Wall Street today. All three major indexes were down, breaking a four-day winning streak. The Dow lost 42 points, the NASDAQ was off two, and the S&P was down 12 points. Over in the bond market, the yield on the 10-year Treasury note dropped to 2.44 percent. This is the biggest one-day decline since February and touching its lowest level in nearly a year. David Lefkowitz joins us now to talk more about the markets generally. He's senior strategist at UBS Wealth Management. David, welcome. Good to have you with us. Thanks for being here. Let's talk a little bit about that stock buyback issue that Dominic uh, just reported on and whether, in fact, the, the fact that corporations themselves have been, I believe, the largest net buyers of equity so far this year, whether that is a sign of strength in the market or a sign that, well, we better buy because nobody else particularly wants to. I think stock buybacks can have a short-term impact on a, a company's share price, but I think over the weeks and months, uh, what's more important is the earnings per share and what that means for earnings per share growth over time. And what the, the buybacks do is they do reduce the share count that companies have outstanding, and that tends to boost 
earnings per share growth a little bit. At a market level, it has an impact of about 1% to 2% of a, of a boost to earnings per share growth. So that's how I would think about it. It can have a little bit of a short-term impact, but over the longer term, uh, it's beneficial in, in a small way for the stock market. All right, so David, what is going to drive stocks to go higher? Okay, today was a down day. We've had some milestones uh, recently on the S&P 500, but what's going to drive the markets? And, you know, what's your overall take on uh, the markets for 2014 so far? So I, I think what's going to drive markets is it always comes down to earnings. And, and earnings this year uh, we think will be up about 8.5%. Uh, and that's probably going to be about the type of gains we see for the market so, uh, over, the, over the, the course of 2014. And, and so far we're really pretty much on pace for that. Uh, we're up including dividends. We're up about 4% so far this year. Uh, annualized, you're getting close to that high single-digit number that I mentioned for earnings growth. Uh, in the first quarter, earnings came in even better than I think many people thought, uh, growing 6%. And that's with the weather being a, a significant negative impact. And I think as you go forward through the rest of the year, yeah, you're going to see a pickup as the weather uh, becomes less of a factor. In conjunction with valuation, which looks yeah, relatively normal, uh, I, think, uh, the, I think we can look to earnings to be the primary driver of, of market gains uh, over the balance of the year. Forgive me, David, if I'm being a little dense here, but let's talk about earnings growth in a context of large share buybacks. If McDonald's goes out and pulls $20 billion worth of shares out of its share count, uh, and then a year from now, I see that its earnings per share are up X percent. Are they really up X percent or is it merely that and are the profits really growing or am I really growing profits by reducing the number of shares over which those profits are, are, are displayed? It's a fair question, Tyler. I, I think the first thing I would I would point out is that uh, about half of the share uh, of the $20 billion will go to dividends. So uh, about half of the $20 billion uh, will go to share repurchases. Uh, but at the end of the day, if I'm a shareholder in, say, the S&P 500, what I want to know is what will be my earnings for each share that I own in the index. Uh, and if the number of shares outstanding are going down because of corporate actions, that does tend to boost my earnings growth rate. Uh, and that's ultimately what I care about as a shareholder. Mm -hmm. David, I want to follow up on something that you put out in a report today talking about select oversold opportunities. You mentioned a bunch of stocks, 18 stocks, everything from Facebook and Google, Yahoo to Blackstone Group, um, saying that many of these stocks have been yeah. oversold recently. And these are opportunities for investments, uh, for investors. Tell us a little bit more of uh, what your message is here. So we, we put out this report because we were responding to, uh, if you recall back a few months ago, the big momentum sell-off and people were scratching their heads about what was causing that. Uh, and I don't think we even know uh, essentially why uh, stocks really fell during the months of uh, March and April in those kind of high momentum areas of, of the market. Uh, so what we thought it was an interesting place to look given that the market is at all-time highs roughly uh, and uh, where should people be looking to invest right now, uh, we thought it would make sense to look at some of those stocks that may have gotten hit in the momentum sell-off, uh, but where fundamentals are still quite good. So we found 18 stocks where uh, fundamentals are good in the sense that earnings estimates for these companies have actually increased over uh, the last three months. Uh, they were sold off in the momentum uh, sell-off, mm -hmm. and our analysts like them. So that's how we came up with this list of 18 stocks. Are you at all worried about uh, what's going on in the bond market with bonds now at two, 246 uh, on the 10-year? What is that telling you, and, and what should we infer from that about the direction of stock prices? Tyler, this is the question that everybody's talking about. Uh, and I think there are, have been a number of factors that are leading to the, the decline in bond yields. I think the, the factor that probably makes them, uh, has the, the greatest weight in my mind is that investors are beginning to price in uh, the fact that the Fed is not going to raise rates mm -hmm. to the extent that it usually does in a tightening mm -hmm. cycle. Uh, so I don't think it means that the growth outlook is necessarily uh, any worse. What it, what it probably does mean, though, is that interest rates are not going to, the Fed is not going to raise interest rates as much as uh, we originally thought All right, uh, David, that they were going to. We have to leave it there. Thank you so okay. much for being with us. David Lefkowitz at UBS Wealth Management.
Valiant Pharmaceuticals has raised its bid for Allergan, the company that makes Botox and other wrinkle smoothers. The Canadian drug maker is now offering $58.30 plus stock for each Allergan share. That could be worth more than, get this, $49 billion. That smooth a lot of wrinkles. Uh, shares of both companies were down in today's session. Valiant by 2%, Allergan by more than 5%. Meg Terrell is on the story for us. Valiant today raising its bid for Allergan by about $10 a share to a total of about $166 based on Valiant's closing share price yesterday. Now that offer also includes what's known as a contingent value right or a CVR tied to the performance of a pipeline asset of Allergan's, a drug for macular degeneration. CEO Mike Pearson spoke with us after an, a presentation to investors today here in New York City saying that investors may have been looking for a higher bid and that's why the stock went down today after the presentation. We're expecting a much higher offer. Um, and uh, if we had had a higher offer, then maybe this deal would have been completed more quickly. Uh, but we are going to remain financially disciplined. We believe this is a great deal for both sets of shareholders. It's what we've heard from both sets of shareholders. But my primary responsibility is to Valiant shareholders, and we're not going to overbid for this asset. Valiant also fighting back today some claims that Allergan has been making, saying that its business model is unsustainable, that its growth is not organic, but rather derived from price increases on its products, and that it doesn't know how to manage global brands like Allergan's. Now, Valiant also drew a lot of comparisons with Bausch & Lomb, one of its uh, bigger acquisitions recently, saying that's a good model for how it would integrate Allergan. Now, the question becomes, does Valiant have to raise the bid again, or does it take the offer directly to Allergan shareholders? which could take a while. And Mike Pearson telling us today they're willing to wait. In New York, for Nightly Business Report, I'm Meg Terrell. Well, there could be another deal in the works, this one in the lucrative medical device industry. Shares of Britain's Smith & Nephew soared on speculation that its American rival, Stryker, would make a takeover bid. Then Stryker said it's not making an offer and ruled out bidding for six months. The stock slumped. But it wasn't over yet. Shares of Smith & Nephew, a perennial takeover target, rose again when Wells Fargo indicated that it might be interested. Smith & Nephew ended the trading day up more than 3 percent. Stryker also rose by nearly 3 percent. Housing isn't as hot as it was a year or so ago, but the high-end home builder Toll Brothers is doing just fine, thank you. Toll's revenues rose nearly 67 percent excuse me, uh, during the start of the critical spring selling season. Diana Olick has more now on why homes for the affluent are selling and what it says about housing in general. For luxury home builder Toll Brothers, it was a banner quarter. With its average selling price up 22 percent, the Pennsylvania-based company said it more than doubled its quarterly profit. We love our niche. We love the luxury end. Our buyers don't have mortgage problems. 20 percent are all cash. Those that get a mortgage put 30 percent down. Their decision to buy is more of a discretionary decision. The average selling price of a Toll Brothers home came in at just over $700,000, which is fast becoming the sweet spot for sales. In April, sales of homes priced under $100,000 fell, while those priced higher rose, according to the realtors. The biggest jump was in million-dollar-plus homes, up over 5% from a year ago. It's easy to say that being rich makes life easier, um, but it does give you a flexibility uh, financially uh, and time-wise that other people just don't have. Real estate brokerage Redfin looked at the very top of the market, the priciest 1%, and found sales up 21% so far this year, while in the rest of the market, the 99%, sales were down nearly 8%. We're not dependent upon the kid coming out of the apartment who can't afford his first house. The wealthiest buyers either pay cash or can qualify easily for a mortgage, while others struggle to make down payments and meet debt requirements. Witness mortgage applications to purchase a home last week down 14 percent from a year ago. On the bright side, mortgage rates hit their lowest level in a year. There's no doubt it's a psychological effect, especially if you're younger people, right, if they think about their longer-term obligations, being able to meet it. Obviously, having interest rates down even to the low 4 percent, below historical levels, obviously, of, let's say, 5, 6 percent. If those rates continue into the summer, we could see sales heat up again. One thing is certain, though, this recovering housing market is far more sensitive to even the slightest rate moves than ever before. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Diana Olick in Washington. Coming up on Nightly Business Report, insurers want to rein in the cost of drugs, and one of the nation's biggest is taking its plan right to the doctors. Will it work, and what does it mean for you?
Shares of Michael Kors wavered between red and green all day despite a strong earnings report, and that's where we begin tonight's market focus. The luxury retailer said quarterly profits jumped nearly 60 percent thanks to a big increase in sales across all regions. It gave an upbeat full-year outlook but warned of margin pressures as it expands aggressively in Europe. But despite the volatility, Michael Kors shares rose more than 1 percent, closing at $97 a share. It was a completely different story for shoe retailer DSW. Shares of that stock plunged after the company posted earnings that missed estimates and it cut its full-year earnings forecast. It blamed bad weather and an aggressively promotional environment for the miss. The stock tumbled 27 percent to $23.62. And today, investors got a chance to react to a new rating on Tesla stock. Standard & Poor's labeled Tesla a, quote, vulnerable investment and gave it an unsolicited, quote, non-investment grade, corporate debt rating of a B-. S&P cited the automaker's narrow product focus and concentrated production footprint. Shares of Tesla were off a fraction to close at $210.24. Shareholders of Chevron rejected a proposal to split the roles of chairman and chief executive. Both positions are currently held by John Watson. Shareholders also voted against a non-binding say on executive compensation and a proposal that would have required Chevron to disclose more fracking information. Shares of the company fell slightly to $122.52. Coke Industries will take Petrologistics private in a deal worth more than $2 billion. Uh, this will give the Coke... Uh, control of a plant that can convert cheap U.S. shale into propylene, which is a key ingredient in plastic. Shares of Petro Logistics surged up more than 10.5 percent to $14.30. And shares of Vivas popped on news. The company's biggest shareholder, Aspen Investment Fund, is planning to offer to buy the company for $640 million. Aspen reported a nearly 10 percent stake in the drug maker today and said it plans to submit a non-binding buyout offer in June. Vivas was up 6 percent to $4.95. WellPoint, the nation's second largest insurer, has a new plan to rein in costs. According to today's Wall Street Journal, WellPoint will start paying oncologists $350 per month for each patient who is on the insurer's recommended treatments. The plan is being viewed by some as transformational, by others as controversial. Joining us now to discuss this, Dr. Sam Nussbaum. He's the chief medical officer at WellPoint. And also joining us, Craig Garthwaite, assistant professor at Northwestern's University, University's Kellogg School of Management, where he specializes in healthcare. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us on this very important issue. Uh, Dr. Nussbaum, uh, let me begin with you because this is a program that you've overseen. Everybody wants to cut costs, understand that insurers want to do this, hospitals want to do this. But um, when you think about someone's cancer treatments, it just doesn't seem like a one size fits all plan will necessarily work. Each person is different. Why do you think this is going to work? And do you expect any pushback on this sure. from doctors and patients? Susie, I'm pleased to be with you speaking about something as important as cancer care. We know that cancer can be a devastating illness, and yet it can be one that is treated. We took on cancer care because, number one, we know that about a third of individuals with cancer don't receive state-of-the-art care. We also know there are just breathtaking new genomically targeted therapies that we want patients to have. Yet, we believe that the current payment model doesn't allow physicians to always prescribe the most cost-effective, the most clinically effective, and the most patient-centered therapies. This program will begin to make a difference, a program where we're paying an enhanced fee for doctors to use evidence care. And there are 60 different clinical pathways. This is not a one-size-fits-all approach at all. These are specific treatments developed by the nations, some of the nation's leading oncologists, that will guide mm -hmm. the very best care. Right. Craig Garthwaite, do you, do you uh, buy what uh, Dr. Nussbaum just said? In other words, that this uh, plan to uh, incentivize doctors to follow a certain protocol will actually improve care? So I think overall it's good that we're trying to get a handle on what we spend on cancer drugs. We spend about $100 billion a year on these medications. It's one of the fastest rising categories. And this is a step towards that, because right now we see 
sweeping variation in how doctors prescribe care, not all of which is attached to clinical outcomes. That being said, I think we do have to have a little bit of a note of caution here in that this is only going to be effective to the degree that we have insurers competing with each other to make sure that we're providing cost-effective care, not just low-cost care. And so we want to have a robust and competitive insurance market that allows patients, if they're unsatisfied with the decision their insurer makes, to vote with their feet and move to another insurance company. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Craig, uh, a few weeks ago, we were talking, you were on our program and we were talking about yep. this new move towards reference pricing, where hospitals, where insurers are going to put a cap on what ho hospitals can charge for various procedures like hip replacements, uh, knee replacements, things like that. Um, mm -hmm. it just, and, now, and now this thing with uh, cancer care. And uh, from the point of view of the consumer slash patient, there's this feeling of c kind of like price controls that are coming into the U.S. healthcare system. What are your thoughts on that? Are we moving so, towards that? So it's, it's, it's very clear we're not moving towards price controls, which I think of as sort of the government coming in and by fiat saying this is what we're going to pay. Instead, what we're really having here is a robust marketplace. And so it's good that insurers are going to push back against pharmaceutical companies and the prices they want to charge. And as long as we have a robust set of insurers competing on this, this could lead to good outcomes. But there are lots of markets in the United States where we insurers have a lot of power uh, and we need to be careful in those markets that insurers are making the best choices for their customers and their customers being patients. Dr. Nussbaum, uh, in today's Wall Street Journal, you're quoted as saying that the payments uh, for physicians are insured, uh, aimed at ensuring that the best drugs and the best protocols are being uh, compensated and that we're creating, quote, revenue neutrality so better care can be given. Forgive me, doctor, but when I think a lot of people hear that, they think that it is a big for-profit insurer selling them a bill of goods, specifically that that insurer is potentially more concerned about its earnings stream and maybe about the $17 billion pay package for the company's uh, CEO than it is about my individualized care. Why are they wrong to think that way? Well, Tyler, first of all, this is a voluntary program. Every oncologist can continue their current treatment patterns using the drugs that they find uh, most effective for their patients. But today, remember that oncologists make about 70 percent of the revenue for their practice based on a percent of the drugs they prescribe. All we're saying is let's create a democratization mm -hmm. over pricing. Let's give doctors that follow the pathways okay. developed by their experts the opportunity to make as much money and give the right care for their patient. All right. I'm so sorry, Dr. Nussman, to cut in, but we have to leave it there. A very interesting conversation. Thank you so much. A Sam Nussbaum with WellPoint and Craig Garthway with Northwestern University's Kellogg School of Management. Thank you. Thank you. Up next, the future is in focus as the biggest names in technology show off their wares in Southern California. We'll show you what you need to know. It's been talked about for weeks, and now it's official. Apple is buying Dr. Dre's Beats. Apple will pay $3 billion for the headphone and subscription music streaming company, most of that in cash. Apple is trying to reinvigorate its iTunes music app as people stop buying albums and single recordings and pay for streaming services instead. Apple was just one hot topic in Southern California today, where some of the biggest names in technology are gathering at the Code Conference. It's hosted by news website Recode.net. And as Julia Borston tells us, the big names have some big plans for our future. Hello, everyone. I'm very excited to be here today for the inaugural Code Conference. Taking the stage to give a peek into Intel's future, Jimmy, the chip company's 3D printed robot, set to go on sale by the end of the year with a consumer version available for around $1,600, the highest end version going for $16,000. Also speaking at the Code Conference, Google co-founder Sergey Brin, making big news, unveiling a prototype for a fully self-driving car. It's electric with no steering wheel, accelerator, or brakes. Brin says it aims to make it easier and more affordable to get around and solve problems like the hunt for parking spots. We've worked with partners uh, like in the Detroit area, in Germany, and California. We've used automotive suppliers, so this is using uh, car parts uh, that are kind of standard, but sometimes we've uh, we've modified them to our needs, for example. But how about the whole body? I mean, are there 
uh, yeah, we've worked with, uh, with partners, uh, auto manufacturing firms that have helped us with the body. Here at Code, there's also a lot of excitement about a product Microsoft says will hit the market by the end of this year, Skype's real-time translator. New Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella said he's focused on building platforms and building software for productivity, showcasing new technology to enable people to conduct business across languages around the globe. What happens is say you teach it English, it learns English. Then you teach it Mandarin, it learns Mandarin, but it becomes better at English. And then you teach it Spanish, it gets good at Spanish, but it gets great at both Mandarin and English. And quite frankly, none of us know exactly why. Uh, it's brain-like in the sense of its capability to learn. Among the media moguls and tech titans here, Twitter CEO Dick Costolo. And while his company's stock is down around 50% year-to-date, he says his long-term view on the company is bullish. I can't focus on or spend my time paying specific attention to the short-term fluctuations in the, in the stock market. I try to focus on a long-term view of building a really durable business, a lasting business. And that includes making sure we're investing into growth. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Julia Borston at the Code Conference in Palos Verdes, California. And one programming note, CNBC parent NBC Universal is an investor in Recode's parent Revere Digital, and the companies have a content sharing arrangement. And of course, CNBC produces Nightly Business Report. And that is Nightly Business Report for tonight. I'm Tyler Matheson. Thanks for watching. And I'm Susie Garib. Have a great evening, everyone. We'll see you tomorrow. Susie Garrett with a nightly business report news brief. Not many bulls on Wall Street today. All three major indexes were down, breaking a four-day winning streak. The Dow lost 42 points, the Nasdaq was off two, and the S&P 500 down 12 points. Valiant Pharmaceuticals has raised its bid for Allergan, the company which makes Botox and other wrinkle smoothers. The Canadian drug maker's latest offer could be worth almost $50 billion. Stanley Fisher was sworn in today as a Federal Reserve governor by Fed Chair Janet Yellen. He won Senate confirmation last week. There's still one more vacancy on the board to fill. And one bright spot in the housing market. Luxury home builder Toll Brothers reported a banner quarter. Profits more than doubled, even as it raised prices 22%. Be sure to tune into Nightly Business Report right here on your public television station.